supporting schools in science education, and supporting a science journalism award. Unraveling these topics for us, we have the honor of hearing from Professor Ajit Dialvis. Senior Professor Ajit Dialvis, like the late Mr. Tennyson Rodrigo, is a chemical engineer and is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies in the University of Murtua. Senior Professor Ajit Dialvis graduated from the University of Moratua and later obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge in 1992. His PhD thesis was the best chemical engineering PhD thesis at the University of Cambridge in the year 1991. He also is a proud past pupil of Aranda College, Colombo. He is a member of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, Institute of Engineers, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Energy Managers Association, Sri Lanka Society for the Advancement of Science, National Ac Academy of Sciences, Sri Lanka, and the International Solid Waste Management Association. So ladies and gentlemen, please Warmly welcome the guest speaker for this evening, Professor Ajit Dialvis. Sir, the stage is yours. Hi, Bowen. Good evening. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, Deshabanya Deva Rodrigo and the Tennyson Rodrigo and Vinita Rodrigo Foundation for the invitation extended. It's an honor uh, to be the speaker in the first memorial oration that is given in honor of uh, Tennyson Rodrigo. It's, uh, I'm humbled by the invitation. I have heard, but not, the per not met the person. It's just through the, uh, the work and perhaps quite connected from a chemical engineering point of view, in this small tiny island, because we have so many few, so few chemical engineers, and uh, so few chemical enterprises that we can speak of, and uh, it's interesting to know that late Mr. Tennyson Rodrigo actually led, perhaps, I should leave out the word perhaps it's the, uh, the most um, impactful or rather the biggest industrial project that is relevant from a chemical engineering point the Sapugas Kanda Fertilizer Facility, and then went on to work on the, uh, lead the uh, petroleum refinery as well. So, uh, and that's perhaps connected to what we have to think, and when he's speaking about forward, modern and forward-looking Sri Lanka, I'm pretty sure at some point he must have got disappointed when things didn't turn out that well, and uh, the first project ended after 12 years, the refinery today is in a, perhaps in a state of crisis. So there's a lot we have to, I'm pretty sure, his mind and his seeing this would have troubled in some way. But perhaps he looked for the other areas uh, to ensure, I mean like uh, carried on as an individual. So uh, again, thank you. And uh, looking at the person and looking at the wishes and coming closer to the area that he has really uh, put in his deed and identified, I just mentioned, education, education, education. Yes, that's what we need. That's what perhaps uh, any human being uh, really requires for this society to ensure that it grows as well as uh, it keeps to its values. That's right education. So taking that topic, I thought I will speak on education, considering the Sri Lankan education, the current situation, and then creative destruction with education for Sri Lanka. I'm sure I'll be able to support and fulfill some of his wishes in terms of what I'm saying and to push in terms of advocacy, to get some of you into action. 
because we all are perhaps believing that we need the stronger, the modern, the future for looking Sri Lanka, but yet, how are we to achieve that? Because at this particular stage, what we are seeing is not something that we can at all be happy about. So there's lots of immense challenges in front of us. But still, we have to rise up to that. And uh, it's up to us, as responsible Sri Lankans, uh, to deliver and to ensure that we take the right decisions and use our knowledge and our efforts in perhaps channeling the country forward from the present position. So that's what embodies in creative destruction. I'm taking it from Joseph Schumpeter in the 1920s from Germany. But of course, that what he was looking at was use of technology and removing the old and then bringing the new, but with the vision of ensuring that what we want and what we are going to get is right for us. And it's right for the future that we all want. So it's in that context that I have put the creative destruction. But in terms of capturing the education, my work, my work here is uh, what I'm positioning are some raw facts, not very serious philosophy, and maybe argued upon, but having felt, and of course having a journey of 36 years plus in education in Sri Lanka. So you feel it if things are going wrong and things are not quite right, and um, so I thought I would place some of those numbers, those uh, scenarios in front of you for the discussion. And what's the contents of this are based on two of my uh, work, in a sense. One is directly singular, um, responsible as an individual. That's this, a policy paper. I termed it as a policy advocacy. Right, because you need to push. If you understand perhaps this is not right, you must state your views frankly and perhaps in the best way you think and then let the decisions to be made after consideration of all facts and figures. So uh, it's a thoughts that have been pushed into the paper. So that's why I put it as a policy advocacy. So it's looking at education for, uh, considering that we are in an era of four industrial revolutions together. And Sri Lanka, are we aware of what the world is actually undergoing? Are we conscious of these situations that are developing? The world will move ahead anyway, and they won't wait for us. So we have to take our own decisions. The second is this. 2020 to 2030 National Policy and Strategic Plan on STEM Education. This has been a parliamentary sessional paper as well. Um, and we spent, there was not politics here, uh, that was all people who was interested in science education in Sri Lanka coming together. And um, 40 plus numbers working for over two years with the blessings of Ministry of Education and the then Ministry of Science and Technology. We had the uh, pleasure of saying that, yes, we need this work. And so the two ministries came together. So I'm basing my presentation, the contents, uh, in the light of, with, uh, in these two uh, documents, submissions that I have been involved with. However, Denison Rodrigo, I think uh, his journey also gives us a lesson for Sri Lanka as well, perhaps from a foreign relations perspective, society development, institutional development, and so on. And interestingly, Colombo is placed in that journey of his because he was the recipient of a Colombo Plan scholarship and one of the very first. And I think it's when you read, you hear a from playing tennis in Colombo and receive the envelope, the letter which says, you have been selected to go to Australia, and then you had to leave Sri Lanka, Ceylon then, in two weeks' time. Can you imagine for that young mind at the time? So because in 1950s, the foreign ministers of the Commonwealth meeting in Colombo decided 
that there has to be this regional cooperation and the need for these emerging countries to develop, and what's the most important, the development of human capital. So it's, it's a factor in any case, but they decided and put this Colombo plan into operation, which happened in 1951. And I think it was in 52 that he left to New South Wales, University of New South Wales, interestingly, to do chemical engineering. And then there was no chemical engineering in Sri Lanka. He has done from University of Ceylon a double maths chemistry degree. And then um, taught at Ananda. And then received this, uh, um, this offer uh, to study in Australia in chemical engineering. And it's interesting how his fellow recipients at the time have delivered for countries. And it so happens that uh, two other members who have been highlighted in the university memoirs are also two chemical engineers. One who has been responsible for gas, water, industry in uh, the development the infrastructure in Singapore, and another who has set up a, a technical university in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And so the point is the need for human capital to grow a country. Why Australia? The Australia was looking at how to come up and then how to connect and to have integration with the rest and then the point was offering what they have done up to now and being a catalyst uh, in developing of human capital. So encouraging uh, students from outside and supporting them and enabling them with knowledge and then moving them across back again and, and hoping that the countries will follow suit as the Australia did. So uh, it so happened that University of New South Wales afterwards became the first Australian university with this outward orientation and became a very, very strong university uh, with this, all these international connections. And of course, we know US, Canada, and so on countries helped the Colombo plan, and the fundings came. And today, you still have it. And Australia have its also its new Colombo plan, where they now put Australian graduates to work in our countries and to support them to move across to our countries and to work, to get, work in uh, different sit in situations. And that's a new Colombo plan which Australia practices. That the Colombo plan office is still in Sri Lanka and uh, the, project, uh, the plan is on. So the young Tennyson had this opportunity and um, it's interesting how uh, he made use of it. At a time, perhaps, would have been difficult also. So perhaps the life, and there would have been many a lesson because the Australia was also in a sense, was under this white Australia scenario. And uh, there were times when in Australia, as we know, the Aborigines were considered as flora and fauna act, not as human beings. So, uh, so it would have been a very, very, it's interesting to say that the first time venturing out of your country and using a medium of transport that you have not been practiced, and it also has a nice story that he stayed at Raffles, and then with a little bit of time going into the buses of Singapore in the city, and then missing the connecting flight. And then, of course, somebody has to find him again to use it for the next flight. Interesting time, interesting situations. However, as we see with from the, uh, the information shared and the knowledge that is available, that uh, he has really made himself uh, to be uh, somebody to be, be noticed, and the word used has been an exotic alumni, right? Uh, person of character and uh, talent and significance. So uh, it's interesting how he has coming out of a country for the very first time, putting himself into a very different situation, has really succeeded. So uh, the lesson is 
how to use these situations, like use of money and use of networking to have development, and something that perhaps we have to do today. Are we making use of our resources in addressing um, the challenges that are facing us? Of course, as said, Tennyson Rodrigo is the, uh, the, the, the honest man. And that also is very really important today to understand that most of our problems have been due to corruption. And we must take out corruption because no amount of science and technology, no amount of any other thing can help a system if we keep the problem still in that place because it will eat from within. So it's important, and I suppose that's what he's looking at from values um, uh, when, he's, when he set out to look at this education and to put his, the main emphasis for his vision for what to do uh, in education. So this is in 60 years later when he returned back to the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and uh, where you can see perhaps the individual, the spirit of the picture, right? And it says, as an exotic alumni, this is what the, uh, the papers are telling, right? When Tennyson Rodrigo came to Australia from Ceylon to study chemical engineering in 1952, he was so exotic that the Herald ran front page picture of him, mind you, a young student from Sri Lanka coming and then finding his way would have displayed something unique from the very beginning, something to get the attention. That would have been there. It's not the usual to get into the front page, right? Let alone to the, any page. So a uh, picture of him attending a ball and he was invited onto ABC radio to introduce Australian audiences to the sitar. And I suppose Dr. Rodrigo Susita read that part, right? Tushara, sorry, um, uh, demonstrated that well and his character. And I will come back to that again. In terms of understanding ourselves when we take decisions about us, about our students, about us, and about the way we do things. So uh, it's, it's interesting. And he returned, and the responsibility or the conditions had been that you spent 10 years in the country to serve back. And I suppose he did, not just looking at the TOR, he delivered in, in so many ways. And the top is the Sapugaskanda Urea Manufacturing Facility. And the next is the Sapugaskanda Oil Refinery. Two of the biggest projects. And unfortunately, Sri Lanka didn't follow it subsequently with other projects of this nature. And these are two very, very important. If we consider the problem of today with urea and the project that we had and the completed plant it was one of the best at the time. And uh, for, for different reasons, certainly not technical very much, we closed it down and sold it. And today, the oil refinery is we are shutting it and opening it up like we are having a government office. Not worthy of a, or the right way to run the refinery. And he gave leadership in both. And uh, because that's what he was, the education he has received, and this is significant. If he had continued to really go on the path, we would not be in this position of having to ask um, haircuts and restructuring and so on, because this is the bedrock. These are the, these are the plans that are really necessary to transform an economy, a society. But we stop there. We don't see such scenarios today, though we are desperately looking at how to achieve some of these transformations with some of the factories. So it was his skill and his energy he did deliver in this. 
subsequently, we perhaps have failed him in not getting to the next stage or the next stage of development that we should have done. So uh, when you look at the deed, um, the trust, the document, which it was mentioned that he did his last minute under pain perhaps, but perhaps so was the desire or the determination to put his thoughts in writing, giving the direction to follow, and it's what the team is doing now. Has considered himself to be a humanitarian with strong aspirations for his country to become a modern, forward-looking nation in the international arena and is firmly anchored in the belief that schools, universities, and other institutions of higher learning have a compelling role and responsibility to discharge as cathedrals of knowledge and wisdom, entrusted with the role of not only disseminating knowledge, but also to create and foster attitudinal change and critical thinking so that education is perceived as a co-pillar in creating the next generation of thought leaders and change agents in the community. We need this badly. So uh, three things highlighting which I thought I will take it up. Modern and forward-looking Sri Lanka. Educational reforms in Sri Lanka and harnessing science and technology to supplanting superstitious attitudes. And it was stressed in no uncertain way the way he looked at this. And we are. You look at it, whatever the direction, it seems superstitious attitudes prevail. And how many of such examples we can now think of. We just put our country down. So in that, we must also recognize late Mrs. Vinita Redrigo, she herself, it's interesting, it's an educationist, 51 years together and from University of Peradeniya, a graduate, and then going to teach at Bishop's College and then ending up as the headmistress of the Vaichali International School. So you can perhaps see the other side what Tushara was mentioning the, 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 con the, the commitment and uh, the delivery on education. And he has anchored on those, the importance of education in his set of objectives for his last wishes. So let me take these three. Starting with Sri Lankan education today, to me a nightmare scenario. Um, I'm putting this in terms of discussion, agree or disagree, but as I said, I too have gone through this and I'm in it with 36 plus years of teaching and research. Perhaps Sri Lanka is unique as a country with a capital city where you see posters of tuition. I don't think you walk into any other capital city anywhere in the world, you will see things like this. And today the posters have become even much more nicer. Neon signs, not papers on wall, right? Um, and this, this situation. You start at 5.30, a child may be starting at 5.30 in the morning and go till 7.30, 8.30, moving from one class to another. In between, you may think of going to the school. And as you grow up to the schools, classes of 12 and 13, the classes are empty, the students are outside all the time. That's the status. So we have tuition, we have this cult, we have developed and supported and we have this entrenched culture. And this is no good whatsoever. And it just feeds rote learning and it's even more worse, there's no thinking in this process. And the student, to me, the life is lost. Valuable time is lost. And there's no development of this individual. You have to now think of how to tackle this. So we have, uh, on the economic front, when you look at it, that's the activity that the student engages in. 
Of course, then behind you have the parents, the grandparents, totally immersed with this progress of the student. And then, capping it is, if you take the household expenditure, you will find in the analysis a significant percentage goes into the tuition cost. And mind you, you are investing where you are unlikely to get a decent return because you are not doing justice to the child's growth with this process. Yet you are investing. You are inputting money. So this is the situation that we have today. And how do we take different decisions? How, do we, how can we expect? So this is, um, this is a situation which, of course, where I kind of figured by when we offer critical thinking that I'll be having, encouraging you to think, take your own decisions, be active, participate. It's different. You don't find students for such scenarios. You will be finding students for when you can say, these are the set of questions, these are the set of answers. I'll guarantee you the A, and I'll guarantee you the position. It's so unfortunate that tuition has not even crept into the university system. As you pass A level, you have tuition classes to select the particular engineering field. Be not based on what you like to do, but based on, for some different reason, maybe what, which field offers you the most, max the most salary or something like that. So you may be pursuing such an objective. And not only that, we may have regional differences and then classes based on how to overcome a, a place, one, one geographic location versus another. And we need to understand these realities if we are to find solutions as well as if we are to change the direction. You need to understand. And I'm sure some in the audience know more about it than I do. That's the situation. Then, of course, moving to the next, with the pandemic, we observe serious disparities that exist in our, uh, in our system, society. How desperate children become sometimes, and so on. Uh, and that's, that's the status, that's the situation. So we basically, in our current system, perhaps, we are removing creativity, we are removing intelligence, and processing a person through the system and coming up at the outside is devoid of these two essential attributes. Yet, maybe a graduate, maybe who has earned certain classes and A's and so on. But we, have we, our system is not doing justice to that child. And our operation or the mechanics of operating are not certainly not doing justice to the child, nor to the society, nor to the country that we want to change. It's important we understand. So Professor Hittige has been very quite clear in this, that existing policies and mechanisms are ill-suited to manage the existing competition for education resources. And mind you, we have installed highly competitive examinations while curtailing resources to the system. So it becomes even more competitive because you are fighting for a smaller number of places or using fewer number of resources. So that's a huge uh, problem. And um, we are unfortunately creating a race that's not useful to anybody. Have you understood the problems of the stage that we have set ourselves and what is creating for the future. Today with pandemic, we are seeing data that a grade three students may be now having, those who went through this when they were supposed to be on grade one, have the abilities or the, uh, what you should be having. You have the grade one kind of knowledge in grade three. And the data perhaps is not yet fully out of the survey data. So uh, we, need to, we need to have understand them, and must act fast as well. That's why I use the term creative destruction. We need to bring in change and change fast because we do not have the luxury of time. 
that's important for us to understand. And we have been reducing the amount of money that's going on. And sometimes you see this example that sometimes 95% of the education spending have been for salaries. Right? If you are putting systems like this, and we see perhaps in 1995, 3.6% of the GDP for education, that perhaps the highest level seen uh, from the figures that we have seen. And then in the recent, as you see, it's dropping. So in the conflict times in the country, we have had some higher values of our GDP allocation for education, while after the conflict, we see this drop. Certainly not something that one can excuse when you're determining the future of a nation and understanding that education is a key pillar that if you want to build the society, we have been taking the money away. And when you have this type of allocation, you can't grow. You can't, you can't do anything decent because you are in survival mode. And that's not helpful. So this needs change. And that's perhaps one of the earlier cries of the university staff in the asking for the 6% commitment to education. Still, it's not happening. And I wrote this um, in an article some time back, and things have got even more worsened. What I said was, oh, my education, I'm two years behind. Today, oh, my education, I'm three years behind. And what is the education I'm talking about? We have two systems running. We have a public education system, and we have a private education system in one, system, one nation. The private education system, if you see today, is actually three years ahead of the public education system. The private education system takes on the, um, have the investment coming from the parents and the well-wishers, and the technology is used, and then the external resources are used because the private education system is externally oriented. The public education system, as I have shown, is lacking resources, and then no technology is really seriously being utilized uh, to understand and implement change. So uh, it's getting behind and behind. So you can see, two, if I have like the Jataka story, where two, parrot, two birds went into two different lots, and then they grew differently, because your exposure is completely different. And that's what exactly happened with two children getting into two different segments, and they will be worlds apart after a few years when you go through these two systems. And the problem is when you have two systems and one nation in this particular one in education, it's not going to help the society to grow again either. And this we really must address as well uh, if you want to have change. So, uh, because there's loss in equity, equality, and of course, excellence is impaired, right? Because the resources and so on. And you are not, basically, you are looking at over the shoulder to different areas, and then you see different, different scenarios developing, and that's also not going to bring confidence. And the young one's mind, when there is no confidence and more conflict, the results are not good. That's what I want to say, because education, the real education is also molding the character. And perhaps molding the character is much, much more important than the knowledge component. Right? That's what real education. In the resource aspects in this world, to get out of this superstition, perhaps any case, any scenario of societies have changed, the science has played a key role. There's no question about it, and something I believed in as well, too. So the Sri Lanka, the STEM base, is seriously lacking. Just take the schools, for instance, what the resources that we have. 
we have about 11,000 schools, let's say 10,000, this number, little change, and there's closures as well. And we have this structure called 1AB schools and 1C schools. And where the 1AB schools means you have science, arts, and commerce in A-level. And that you can see is like um, such a small number compared to the larger number, so one-tenth, right? So the, as you grow, the availability of science is not there in majority of schools. Don't you think that's a problem that we face? So uh, we have, again, uh, the other schools which have um, arts and commerce A level, but not the, I um, mean, like arts, but not, uh, not science. So there is, a re there is a crisis because children are growing. And the point is we are not exactly emphasizing STEM. We are talking about STEAM now, right? Um, pure science is not going to make the person the character. The point is we need the arts and humanities. But the point is, is the environment where you're learning and growing up, you don't have this mix. You don't see what others are learning. And there is no healthy cross-fertilization of discussion, the knowledge, and so on. And that means a separation. And that's the problem that we are facing. But you need a strong science base. It's important. And that is what was seen in India, what Jawaharlal Nehru did, in a sense. 1947, August 15, there was the Ministry of the Department of Research. The science was pushed in. Sri Lanka literally went in a different direction. There's no embracement of science whatsoever. And that's a big problem. So uh, we have, again, if we are to look at nation building, we cannot have this STEM pipeline that is currently happening has so many leakages. That's another problem that we need to understand. The number of students coming through, we do have decent primary entry, we do have decent secondary entry, but we have very bad tertiary entry. From the secondary to tertiary, it drops from a 99, 98 point to about 21%. That's a drop. And of them, how many are doing science? or STEM-related is much less. And then what's at the end of the day is also we find they take wings, they leave. And the one reason, they also sometimes say, look what I can do here. The society, we are not demonstrating that we are going to use your knowledge. We do not demonstrate that you are required. That scenario, going back into the Columbia plan, going back into the selection of that engineering. And they are primarily addressing human capital and looking at one society that has come up and then trying to transfer that knowledge to our countries. So there was that purpose, there was this understanding, and the decisions were made to bring them, empower them, and let them lose in their own countries, enabling those to grow. And you, you saw the base, the base subjects that they have looked at. We are not demonstrating that we need them. We need those subjects. So we have, as I said, we have moved away from science. We have not really seriously talked about scientific decision making. And that's a big, big problem that we are having today. And right now, the issue is even more worse. We have, again, another brain drain scenario taking place in the country. This is compounding, right? So we must understand. And it's very interesting, because I'll take an Australian example on the corner. A 1% increase in people choosing STEM careers can contribute $50 billion to the Australian economy, US dollars. Just 1% of school children switching to a STEM, they are predicting my economic benefit in time to come is this. So it's a kind of plan development. You understand how do you drive students and what the end result would be to the economy. That's good thinking. That's good planning. And it's a very good strategy. But because of, because of the brain drain that we're having and the system, we're actually giving Australia perhaps 50 billion on a plate because it's our 1% that is getting added to that Australian economy. 
we must also understand the situation. If you fail to understand the value, there's no way that you can capture somebody. It's not going to be authoritarian, right? There has to be the freedom of choice. But we need to have some responsible decision making and also communicate well that what we should be doing right now to restore confidence in the first place. So this is, this is reality today and been for some time. Even to another level. Well, we say we have the human elephant conflict. Interesting. And sadly, the elephants come out worse. Of course, we suffer as well, right? Lost of lots of lives and so on. But I just want to show that even though elephants are in trouble, we have an even bigger trouble. That is when you look at another human capital segment that the society badly want, badly needs. Just look at, in research, in the top tier of the education system, research empowers, research actually directs, and good research pushed the country on the map. That's what is nice about it also. And then that kind of placement on the map brings back accolades and then um, the whole communication, the spirit that you are living through, the society changes. So good research has really a lot of benefits to the society. Now what is interesting is I'll just read quickly. Um, and one of the things is we don't have the current data. We are a few years behind in data in all the time, even though this is an era of big data. Just look at Sri Lanka. We have about researchers for one million. This has not changed very dramatically with time. Uh, I'm just taking this example for this uh, 278, let's say, to this year. And at the time, Singapore was having 8,486 per million, right? Now, what's interesting is, if we multiply by millions that we have, and the million that Singapore has, basically, you can see that Sri Lanka has less than the number that Singapore has per million. No wonder today, and for the last few years, Singapore has been on the top of the global innovation countries. In the Global Innovation Index, Singapore has positioned itself in the top 10 in the last years. And uh, it's another small country that has been occupying the number one spot, Switzerland. Right? So, uh, whereas Sri Lanka, we are this year we went up to the 85th place from the 95th and so on, but the point is we are in that. The India has moved up to the 45th position this year. So we do not have supported research, the researchers, and so on. It's not just, um, and the, the point of research is it adds, it adds knowledge, and then when you invest knowledge back, you generate money. So as I've showed, we have not invested money to generate knowledge, which is a research component. And the development component is once you invest the knowledge, you then generate income. So Sri Lanka has been very poor in that equation, in the front, in the input, and also realizing from in the output. But of course, when you have a poor input, you don't have much to work with for the second half of the equation. That's what we have been suffering. But that understanding is very important. And countries like Singapore has really understood. And they, they work on this. And that's what Lee Kuan Yew did. So uh, education is key, right? And there's all different ways of doing it. And that's what uh, we need to understand. So these are, these are results that I want to put in as the conditions, again, if you take the global, the sustainable development goals of today, Sri Lanka, the best one actually interestingly is SDG 4, which is education. But simply because the SDG 4 looks at simple indicators that Sri Lanka as a result of some forward looking steps done in the early stages, we are still benefiting from those numbers. And the SDG 4 is not actually challenging the country 
to, uh, to place, your, place itself in a better way. So we are using some weak indicators, and as a result of these weak indicators, we find Sri Lanka doing well in SDG 4, which is our best performing SDG, actually, if you look at the SDG dashboard for countries. Anyway, forgetting, uh, taking that aside, I mentioned about the Global Innovation Index. So we need to understand uh, that's the importance of it is we communicate with each other and demonstrate where we are and what are we doing, and it's not that good. And in the global IQ standing, uh, it's not something that's regularly done, but in the last published one, in Asia, Sri Lanka is just above Nepal, while some of the Asian countries are in the number one, two, three slots. So we do also have a comment which says, as you progress in generations, you have your IQ level goes up, going up. The generation picks up an IQ, and then there's a, uh, there's a kind of like a rule which, in, which indicates the, the, the IQ growing up. And interestingly, uh, Lee Kuan Yew even pushed Singaporeans to marry and produce children and to ensure the society gets its real, um, real value to drive the society. Um, that's interesting. One can look at the story of what Lee Kuan Yew did in that sense. Because he was looking at capturing um, uh, the value uh, to the society because he understood, unless we have this, we are not going to grow. We are not going to be the society that we want to be. So it all boils down to this simple E and do that in a very creative way. So the investments and um, uh, the rewards, uh, we know that in education, is um, not there in the same. The reason being, we have not really positioned the importance of, uh, in some of these subjects, um, in, the, in our economic decision making uh, well. And as a result, uh, we find this segment uh, poorly discussed. Right? So uh, investments poor. As a result, there's no rewards. And then um, you don't feel like, like these, are, these are the sectors that I must get into. More important, just highlighting, we must also have education with values, the character building. And if you go back to the 1943, uh, the CWW Karnangara report for the, 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 uh, the state council, it, 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 demand, it shows that the true education, the value of true education, the first is not filling the mind with facts and figures and knowledge and so on, but very important to ensure the character building part, the values in it, the cultural component. So that too is important. And it's perhaps today when we see, open the newspapers today, the amount of clashes, the amount of scenarios that we see from school, whether you're the student and the teacher, we see that this huge, that issue that's, that speaks out of the newspaper to us, right? It's not fun reading those. Those events are not happy news. So uh, it's again something um, we, we must concentrate on. I want to touch on this as well because the nutrition is very important for a child. And this is something perhaps, again from the very beginning of um, Sri Lanka has lost its way. You speak, you look at the values for children under five years of age, the stunting and wasting, that's a muscle mass and the height for that age and so on, what one should be having. Actually, it's a very, um, when you look at this uh, UNICEF report in, um, 2018, the Sri Lanka is placed in the ninth position. This is the worst part, right? You are talking about top worst countries in the world. So Sri Lanka is in the ninth position between Eritrea and Somalia. And we have heard about these countries, right? Specifically Somalia, even right now. And here is Sri Lanka, the granary of the East. So. Uh, why I'm pushing this, this need to understand again, because you starve the child at early stage, it's all impacts on your cognitive development. And what's going to happen subsequently? These are going to be issues that surface much, much later, and definitely way too late for one to address. And you blame the individual for a, not a fault of theirs, because the so society has been neglecting them at the time when you have, you have to have the responsibility for them. And we have, we have neglected. And this is, the, this is a situation where the children are today growing. And uh, so unless you have the cognitive development, 
going back to that IQ issue, we are on a downward trend. And just imagine what's going to happen when you have this, the society having a low IQ group that coming out and someone have to accept the mantle of leadership, or oh, right, drive and contribute. So unfortunately then we lose the stock, we don't have the stock that we need. So it's important to concentrate on this nutrition aspect. So it's not just food security, we add nutritional security too. And this situation still prevails and it has been aggravated again by the current scenario. And one must address that as well because for the latent effect, the potential issues that can surface later. But that is the responsibility on us. If you know, if you understand the importance, then we can act now and we should act now. Because that's where the future. Again, uh, at some point I wrote this steaming stem, but moving from horoscopes to telescopes. This is in line with what Mr. Tennyson, Rodrigo did um, basically indicated, right? I, I, I suppose he must have this feeling very strongly the way I heard when Tushar expressed. Uh, and this is really sad, right? Even in the absence of newsprint today, our papers still publish supplements on stars and issues. But we have not much papers for the examinations. Right? Each Sunday newspaper in the languages, you will have a supplement. Not in the English one, but on the others. Singular one specifically. So, uh, and this is uh, serious. So in the absence of science literacy of our citizens, uh, we do have a big problem. And this is really need to be addressed uh, fast. If you look at all the journalistic awards, journalist awards that have been handed over in Sri Lanka, there is no award for science journalism except by the Sri Lanka Society for Advancement of Science. But the major, the Prest Institute and the very much more higher um, uh, uh, in ar different areas in the, in the journalistic cycle, circles, that award is not there for science journalism, not at all. And I always take this issue about, okay, what magazine was there in the in US first? Was it Playboy or the Scientific American? The Scientific American is the oldest, the magazine in US. And it's very interesting how, 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 it, how it shapes uh, the communication and shapes, shapes a society, right? And uh, we, we lack this segment, um, uh, emphasis in this segment seriously and perhaps something uh, that we seriously should work because media can play a major role and once the media drives you have an exponential effect that you can because it percolates through and there are no limitations on one to one communication it's, it has a multiply effect. We must set our society on track for this because at this situation science literacy at a very very low level in Sri Lanka and that means people are open to so much of exploitation of different ways. And that's not right. They, sh they don't deserve that. But unfortunately, they're susceptible because of the underlying condition. So we must address this. And that, uh, that's important. So that's the, that's the situation. That's why I said we are having a nightmarish scenario developing, or rather existing at present, and have chances of becoming bad or worse if we do not understand an address. Now comes to the second part, the creative destruction with education for Sri Lanka. And I stress for Sri Lanka. So the creating new and destroying the old. Now this is not destroying in a negative sense what we should not be having and what should be translating ourselves or transforming ourselves, we should have that. And if the point in this time is it cannot be a gradual transition, it probably needs some acceleration. The creative destruction from Schumpeter thinking, it's about bringing technology. And we know there's significant technology that is uh, taking roots in, 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 in society. We are running four industrial revolutions together at this time. 
We have nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and neurotechnology. There's not a, a time in the world where have, we have one was observing four industrial revolutions running at the same time. So we are, in a sense, experiencing something quite novel. Four industrial revolutions. But do we feel it? Do we even see the importance of it in making use of them to transform our society? It's not there. The urgency or the knowledge, perhaps, is not there. So creative destruction is an industrial mutation in a sense. It's industrial in the sense of system mutation that revolutionizes the structure from within. So it has to be us, and we must drive that. It's important we understand. Do not forget, as I said, Sri Lanka played, Sri Lanka was positioned really nice, in a, in a good position when the MDGs were coming to an end in 2014, the end, when the SDGs began in 2015. The reason for Millennium Development Goals, not that we did great in that period, we did great because of few of the things that we have done before. And that's the CWW Kanangara reforms and having this free education and universal health care running for like six decades really gave these MDGs, uh, I mean, like we had a, we had a, uh, st we started from when the, where the other countries were expecting to end. So we did really well there. But because of our own actions in some time past, not, we were not driven by UN goals. We had done it ourselves. But unfortunately, perhaps, with time, we failed to capitalize. We definitely failed to capitalize. So come to SDGs, which about eight years to go to 2030, we are not doing that well, because those the goals are much more challenging, and it's different. So the imperatives we need, as it was mentioned, education, education, education. And everybody has said this. Even the countries that have heralded the Industrial Revolution Again mentioned, reiterated, we need to look at this sentence again. We need education back again. So you can't allow it to go. You can't allow it to slide down, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's been highlighted all the time because of its central importance. So you need investment and education, and it should be done in what I would say as in one platform. We should not have... Uh, in two different pathways. Remember that I said about we have two systems in one country. We must bring innovations in education. There's lots of education innovations taking place around. Uh, we need to understand that, and I'll touch on this. We have to take very strong steps in eliminate disparities, and it won't happen in a day. Now, having come thus far, we need to understand that we need to spend time but we need to demonstrate with a roadmap. We are very clear. We are not going to stray. We are focused on getting these things done, addressing. It's important. So one system, multiple pathways need to look into. Education must be done with a purpose. We need to look at the nation getting the benefits of education. We cannot afford the freedom to take a choice. That's a different thing. But the country cannot be, be, I mean, like, stay blind to the fact that once educated, that you don't want to walk, work here. That is, you need to understand why. And that should be corrected. You should feel that, okay, I am, I am, I am from here. I learned, I have this education, and in some cases, free education, and I'm disappearing. So why are we disappearing? And why we have this tendency? So we need to understand and we must address that as well. So definitely we need STEM, more so STEAM, and entrepreneurship. We need to put this economy, and that should be engaging in the right entrepreneurship, right? With values, this is important. And of course, the information revolution, one of the four revolutions we must seriously embrace. We are losing students with knowledge in this area because we are simply not allowing them to practice. They are opening up startups in other countries because we are, we are not encouraging them. What they produce, 
our procurement system is not allowing to be purchased. We have archaic procurement mechanisms that ignores that changes are so rapid that you cannot ask from this child who is coming out to the graduation in 20 has done a product, what have we been doing over the five years of track record? That's not right in software. That's not right in some of these areas. You don't have a five-year track record, right? And but our archaic system asks you for that history, and otherwise you're not even qualifying. So these principles need to be taken out, removed. And we know the errors, but we are turning a blind eye. And that's what I mean by creative destruction. You must take them head on and eliminate them. And you need committed teach for Sri Lanka. And even now, teach for United States is on, right? As we speak, this program is on because you, they also understand they have issues. You cannot have all places served equally. You don't have the ability to distribute resources. But you must encourage volunteerism, and you must get the knowledge being imparted to um, different communities where there are certain differences. You must try to understand the disparities exist, so we must act on them. And how do we do that? So even in a country like the country with the most number of Nobel laureates, do have scenarios, situations like Teach for America. We need a committed Teach for Sri Lanka situation where we can harness 100,000 hours of teachers on a volunteer basis to go in certain places and commit themselves to a day and so on, and then the teaching of uh, teaching of children. And that could have a very fast uh, catalytic effect on, um, on resource sharing, because you are volunteering, you are showing things, and then suddenly the children will see differently that I'm not neglected anymore. I'm getting support, and I don't want just the money, right? But I'm getting, I, I, I feel care from different parts of the country, and that's important. And that's building trust. So north, south, east, west, doesn't matter. We need to have this type of situation. And we can look towards what Teach for America stands for. And we must embrace comparison with benchmarking with others. On the things like PISA, we don't do that. Uh, program for international schools assessments, and so on. We have stayed away, even though at one point we tried to do this. We got a budgetary approval, uh, but we then didn't do it. It's important for us to understand where we stand. This is not competition, in a sense, but we must understand our position. We must. It's not from a competitive point of view, but it, we, have to be, uh, we have to be pragmatic, too. So while bringing um, the kind of teaching or the different uh, scenarios that we today the, the, today the environment needs, the 21st century changes, we must embrace. So it's important to understand, when I was looking at these reforms, uh, we had this target, I was repeating the second document. I was looking at this statement of Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. The Dutch, the British, the French never gave us any technology. They built our universities, but they never taught us engineering. They taught us medicine, law, history, culture. They withheld the modern part of the industrial society. And Lee Kuan Yew understood that at the very beginning. That the growing, the society, the growth comes from this aspect of engineering, the technology. The technology propels a society forward. And he understood it very early, and that's why this small country is now on the top of the innovation states of the world. So it's important uh, we learn. So this was the proposal in that where we completely change the way that education, uh, the, pro uh, the program, where we learn from the best as well, and we go modular, we give freedom, we take the stress out of the examinations, there won't be that competitiveness, um, and then you may have freedom to move around, and definitely there will be the option, or rather the encouragement of a science student doing Western music. As a mandatory unit, in the sense mandatory, you're not putting this you have to do, but the point is, if you're doing these streams, you must also study a couple of these subject areas. So you infuse, it's not just STEM, then the STEAM comes in. So similarly, for that humanity student, you have to take some of the basic sciences. 
that has to be that the basket of subjects that you have to do. You have to select, you are pushed to select, and you have a choice, and this is how these pillars were developed. And in the middle, we also put in a business and an enterprise a pillar for A levels. And they need not go to the immediate of the universities. You can have a better sense of doing business and go out and work and maybe have a lateral entry later on. Just taking this, the whole, um, whole structures out. And that was uh, that what we came out with. And uh, so it's advanced level and also putting vocational studies at an equal place, equal place, like the German system. The German system is very strong in this way, right? So the science and technology pillar, the business and enterprise stream, the humanities and social studies stream, and vocational studies stream, and then you go down the universities, vocational education, the, all that's on equal point, and then you have your choice uh, career, but also in the secondary education, you would be given much more career guidance as you move up to the third stage. So there will be much more interest, uh, important career guidance given at that level when the child, child, child is kind of understand, looking at what I like to do and then what are the choices that I have. These two, um, and Sri Lanka is seriously weak again even if you come to science and technology, we deviate between biology and maths, which is serious harm that's causing to our system, right? Uh, and that's very important, so we must look at STEM. And when we see these situations like mapping by countries like uh, Malaysia, where they map even up from the kindergarten to the up, when their children come up, they know exactly how the, their industries are going to be taken. And looking at conventional industries as well as the new industries, you can see the newer, newer industries are also positioned. So it's very interesting, one page having the entire education system and the economy match, mapped. So uh, they have an understanding. It's not rule, it's basically not, but you understand your structural development taking place and see the movement and then see how the economy is going to get. And then you see the society. And there is this very serious SNT human capital roadmap. That's what they have done for this. So uh, something we again need to put in place. Similarly, different levels, the technology pyramids, the, the research, the implementers, like the technologists, the operators, the technicians, and so on. There is that, uh, the pyramid that actually supports uh, the economy, the quantification and the understanding has to be put in. These are, these are practices that have, been that have been done in the outside, but for whatever the reasons, we, have, we, have not, we are not doing. So we have no real idea what this industry segment is going to have from this university or this vocational school. So that's why we end up probably sometimes having more going through in the beauty, uh, the, the beauty, beauty studies in our tech vocational while some of the medical technology stays with absolutely no entries in that vocational training. So we do see these um, serious issues because we are not planning and then we are not saying, look, this is the way to do and then encouraging students, based on their likes and dislikes and so on, pushing them, encouraging them to move in, saying that you have choices, and you have these, all these openings, and the industry awaits you, right? And also giving the hints, uh, notice to the industry, you must embrace uh, this process. So we know the technology and social innovations have transformed education. There's too much, uh, so much today happening, and we may not have even the concept of the teacher. We may have a resource provider. We may not have the concept of a classroom. We are talking about a flipped classroom. So we must embrace technology, and that's what uh, situations like uh, what I was talking about in creative destruction. I remember in myself personally, at grade six at Ananda, when I was looked at to put uh, an animal for the biology class on paraffin, putting the live animal and pouring paraffin stop me going to bio, even though I still like bio. And I ended up looking at, um, looking at chemical engineering, also these putting chemical, uh, biochemical engineering and bio into that system, which is happening in the world, and we know this with, uh, like Moderna, the, the COVID vaccines, this comes from MIT chemical engineering startup, right? So we, in STEM, we have to have the healthy understanding of all the sciences. So that's why we have science, technology, engineering, mathematics. 
So we, everybody has, there's no division between the mathematics on one side and the biology on one side. So we have, we have to have that. And that's how you can look at uh, the society and address issues. So we must understand that. And the schools of the future is another en encouragement. How do we transform our students to, ha to be happy and be creative in their learning spaces? Today, when you walk into a classroom, I'm not sure whether you feel very happy. In our system specifically, they are not print, print density is very poor. You may sit, stand, and then in, um, engage in that whatever the business that you came into, and you want to leave at the east, earliest possible opportunity that given, you want to leave the classroom. They're not places that you want to sit, and then you're not encouraged. So when you see these situations with this technology and so on, they don't, it's not the question of cost. It's the questions of intent. Are we keen to transform our classrooms? Because this is where our future is being trained. And unless and until we take action on those, we are not going to get them out. And then when they come out in a different way, they are not going to be helpful. Don't blame them at the later stage. Understand that we need to act on today. So this is what an example of World Economic Forum has compiled scenarios of different countries. And I've taken the Vietnam example because you know Vietnam is now raising again in front of us, and they started in 1986 from out from nothing, and um, it's so different, and even in high-tech exports and so on, so not just textile. And it's, uh, so we have to look at uh, this, this type of situation. So world is shaped by technology. We need the education to be shaped by technology, because that's education is going to shape the technology again, if you do it right and the society will be empowered. So we know that we are living in times where the, the jobs are going to be changed, the jobs are going to be lost basically because of the way the technology is pushing us, coming us. So uh, we need to understand we are making ourselves in some quarters obsolete by our own innovations. We need to understand that and that needs to be factored because we must look at the future that is coming in front of us, not take it from the past. So we see when you look at things like future jobs, and we say today, even if you read, do the curriculum, that curriculum is not going to help you in a few more years' time down the line. Even maybe when you graduate, that curriculum is not helpful. So uh, it's such a, such a situation that when you see, think, see the, some of these titles, and even in Sri Lanka, there was one time you were asking for the drone operators to deliver medical, med medical stuff using drones in faraway places, and the advertisement went, you don't have many people coming in, right? So that's asking very quickly, and it's your, you can't change. So we need to make ourselves that the scenarios that are have, um, the emerging are different. So this is why the journalism component is important. I saw this, and I put it because it's a personally from a chemical engineering point, and you have this type of ad coming, Matskala Chemical Engineering Gin Bio Nam. So this is kind of thing, we, because we demonstrate that we are not aware of what exactly is happening and what exactly these fields are. And as a result, we have it. And again, if I do take, if I don't like to do, put that animal into distress, but I have now these devices, like multiple devices, multiple tasks, MTMD devices, that now enable me to do the dissections, understand the anatomies and all that on the table and I can do it augmented reality and the virtual reality. So then I do the minimum of such scenarios. So um, the technology has enabled me to be very much of um, express my, if I don't, if I have passion on animals, I don't want to do any harm, I still can do something I like without exactly going through that process. So it's quite wonderful in that way. And um, so I still can immerse myself in an area that I like to do. That's the power of technology. So let's, we need to understand these things. And another small area we must work on is the informal science education. In this region, Sri Lanka is the only one that is not having an informal science education place, an opportunity. We do not have a, a science museum, science exploratorium, and so on. It's not in Sri Lanka. More than 50 is available in India. Nepal, you name it, they have these scenarios, but not in Sri Lanka. And that's where the families 
and the science literally takes shape, right? So again, something where we need to put our thoughts and maybe efforts and take it out that Sri Lanka gets this. So it's, it's, um, it's very important because you are on experiential learning, you are not, this is not an exercise that you get tired because you are engaging yourselves. So you go to a country like any place outside, you see this, the parents, the children, all engaged in this type of activities, which at the end of the day boosts the science literacy in the society. And you become much better because you know. And it's much easier to communicate how things are changing. Nanotechnology comes in. You don't have to go through in a very deep way. You see the products of nanotechnology and you, you, you just experience it. You see the lotus effect on textiles and you become amazed. I don't have to wash my garments anymore. And that's nanotechnology in action. That child seeing that for the first time would understand things better, maybe motivated for different things. So you go from China to any other country, you will find, and you will find mothers even pushing their babies who have no clue whatsoever maybe, coming into these places. I'm pretty sure you have been exposed to this. But where is the place in Sri Lanka for this? It's not there. It's missing. Right? So that's one of the, one of the reasons that we are, we, are, we are pushing the students in the wrong direction. We, they don't get the opportunity, uh, and so they're delayed. So it's important we transform some of our schools where even at least have these different mechanisms, places, what we may in US call the maker spaces or action, action places. And it's not, again, costly to do. What you need to take is one decision and put some space and put some stuff, and you have, you have a flipped classroom effectively. You engage your action-oriented learning. It's important for, for us to go from this direction. And India is seriously benefiting from this because they are talking about one million children innovators to coming out at the end of this exercise, what they use as Atal Tinkering Labs in schools. Very simple, but action-oriented. And there is no subject uh, di division. You bring things together, what's happening, and then they dismantle, they assemble, they collectively learn a lot, uh, do that exercise. And what their expectation is stirring up the imagination, and the student is different, and the child is different, and that's very beneficial uh, to the society as well as to everybody. And it's very important for us to know. So we, it's time we create some creative learning spaces in our schools, and that's an effort that is a decision away from doing. Not much money. We decide on it, and one can do that. So it's important. Our children are missing this totally in the country. And it's no wonder you get attracted to the outside. This is what I meant by print density in a classroom, right? We miss this. Yesterday was the Global uh, World Science Day. So very happy to say that we opened up the first maths cafe a similar sort, Moratua, uh, at the MGF uh, tea room uh, by the roadside. And this is all action, the learning maths through games, where a pioneering teacher in Sri Lanka has come up with about 98 games. So kind of pushed this idea by uh, National Innovation Agency uh, and the Commercial Bank together to start up this. What we want is the parents and the children to come engage in playing carom, but not, you, are, you are not exactly playing carom, you are learning maths. But that's the best way. And you know in Sri Lanka, maths is a problem. Maths had been a problem. And it's very important we should not have that problem. We should take, uh, remove that as a problem because maths is so important and so basic for any area. So going back to late Tennyson Rodrigo, and that's what I remember with what Tushara so eloquently, in a sense, the address. I, I unfortunately cannot emulate you in that direction. Right. Earlier we had from Subhashite, Lovin Nekek Ekdeya Katavei Samatha. And I think with today's knowledge, that's no longer true. When Howard Gardner came up with the theory of multiple intelligences, he was talking about at the initial stage, eight intelligences types. So there was one was the musical intelligence and so on. So that the brain in eight parts, today you may say, 
functional resonance imaging, I mean like MRI, functional MRI, may even lit up certain parts of the brain and we can say, look, this brain, you, it's like having eight computers in your brain, right? Because uh, one component, there are different elements of intelligence that can be uh, improved and worked on. So this is what we have been innate characteristics, but how you transform that innate characteristic abilities to a position of strength is through that activation. That's education. That's exposure. That's the environment that you create for achieving that. So in that, he actually came a little later with the ninth verse, ninth intelligence parameter as well. So today we speak of theory of multiple intelligences, nine elements. One can look into those nine, I'm not going to do. So we now have to take Subhashite out from that point. It's not just one. So, but it gives us an opportunity because Lovin Nekek Boho Data Vay Samatha. And that's what some people have shown. And that's what T.M. Premavardhara wrote in this book, Lovin Nekek Boho Data Vay Samatha. So it's important to understand the children and the child today has this, I mean, we all have been having the ability. And in our education today, we can bring this new knowledge to sharpen the child for a different future because we understand that we are not constrained by some of the probably the old thinking. Okay, that person can get uh, strengthened on this area and that's it. No, today it's different. We see that. And that opportunity exists right here. And it's how we do that. So technically, it's like networking these seven, eight computers Imagine the potential if you do it right. That's an asset to the society. That is the asset to the growth, asset to our growth. So we must do that. And I think perhaps what Tennyson and Rodrigo technically demonstrated in that musical abilities, because I suppose he probably have taken refuge in this as well um, uh, at mid time. The moment he landed, he has shown in this, going to the ABC radio and his picture appearing on the front page as well. Now, this is another one. That what I referred in the front was different. It's a Herald newspaper in Australia. So this is the that Australian Broadcasting Corporation uh, reporting about him and Sita. Uh, so right. Uh, and then, of course, when you read these uh, Sunday Times uh, write-ups, I suppose what you said about his English and our ability to understand, this layers a difference. So uh, the talent is shown. Now it's again showing, right? And I can put the Sapugaska and the urea facility on one side and playing Sita on another side, or the uh, describing uh, on um, some, um, this uh, word is requiem on another way. I, you can see that the different, different points are being activated and the different abilities of the person. So it's, uh, it's important, that's why I stressed on this team, right? So if you take that I'm only emphasizing science, no, I'm not. We need to bring that. That's why the reform that we have looked at, opposition, connect, bringing music and drama into the science, removing these separations of biology and maths and avoiding such things, bring all that into the basket. In the business, you understand whether you go into the business on a science direction, which is tech entrepreneurship, or in another direction to the entrepreneurship. Either way, the entrepreneurship. And then en enriching them to go move forward in time while being very useful at the end because you are empowered. So it's important to think this was when he was appreciated for being a, a one of the first um, visited to Australia in Colombo Plan by the High Commissioner. But to me, the most important point in that write up is this cathedrals of knowledge and wisdom. In the United Kingdom, a cathedral, when you have the cathedral in a place, it becomes a city. To call the city, you need a cathedral. But at you missed, one of the chancellors, vice chancellors, indicated that university should come to that position of a cathedral because it can play a major, a major role and a contribution to the place where it is. And what the UMIS did in that point was, or the University of Manchester now, was putting up a climate, prof, climate challenge, climate roadmap for the city of Manchester. So, and he said that it's not a case of just putting knowledge out, but creating people, creating this next generation leadership to come out of these places. So it's a, it's a double responsibility he was talking about for the universities. And as put in the words, cathedrals of knowledge and wisdom. 
So it's important to understand the individual. And as I said, he went, conquered, came back, delivered. And then it's also important for me, I, I like this, to me, just indicate that Tama Upamba Ratata Danani Ratata Sevya Kalhot Pamani. It's important to have this ethos as well in the mind that uh, perhaps in an area that we have failed, and we fail, but that's again part of the development. That's what was mentioned by the value part, right? Equally with the knowledge part. Knowledge alone may not give that character to that individual. So let me conclude with something when late Abdul Kalam visited University of Moratua, and I'll stretch to the second line for the Deshamani Deva Rodrigo as well and the team, uh, maybe as an idea. So, Abdul Kalam said to our students, be more dedicated to making solid achievements than in running after swift but synthetic happiness. That synthetic happiness today may be like posting pictures on the Facebook and getting up in the morning to see how many likes have come around. It's certainly synthetic happiness and not that productive. But we seem to be thrive on that, and we seem to be pushing in that direction. But he was very, very, very solid in advising the students when he visited in this way. So what I might ask and what I have tried to do as part of this invitation, and honoring the individual as well, honoring the wishes of the individual who wrote those sentences which I have I repeated here. And what I said was, we are in a problem scenario. However, we need to understand the problem, and we must put ourselves and our energy and our knowledge, perhaps, to get, us, our, get ourselves out of it. But in this point, is ensuring the children that they get a better and a different education, and with that, they are empowered to deliver back to the society. Not in a handout mode, but in a way that they are capable, then they are, their natural talents are strengthened. So I hope with those thoughts that what I will is another Abdul Kalam sentence, once your mind stretches to a new level, which I was trying to do with this empowering with these views, may not be right or may be even argued upon. It never goes back to its original dimension because you are now a little bit more enlightened and maybe you see the urgency. What I may have done is poor, merely bringing few uh, pictures of the puzzle together and showing the picture. A dark picture, perhaps, but we have solutions as in there. So with that, and again, thanking for the invitation and also remembering a chemical engineer. And I see this again when I look back or try to picture myself, the urea facility. I went into the urea facility towards the end of the, as I joined the university, to bring pieces of that plant to the university for teaching purposes when that plant was being dismantled. And you can see pieces of it at Peradenia, you can see few pieces at Moratu as well. But the majority went for, uh, majority of them were again sent back to another country to run the factory in another country. That's what happened. It was a sad day when it was closed. And we see the same picture probably emanating, emerging for the refinery as well. So uh, with that, and wishing that the wishes to be realized and to be supported, and while we say that, we, do our, we will give our best and our, 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 whatever we can to on those because they are noble wishes. Um, I, th I stopped here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for treating us with your profound thoughts, brilliant ideas, and splendid suggestions. Um, even though you have left the stage, I would like to give this opportunity for the audience to direct any comments or questions for Professor Ajit D. Alves. Please raise your hand and a mic will be brought to you. Okay, I see a question in the back.
for that wonderful opportunity to open our minds to the possibilities of the future. Uh, I was myself thinking, if you are going to deconstruct education, should we not start at the very beginning in our preschool years? Because I believe that schools literally kill creativity. Should we not have the most vulnerable of our children being educated by, I think, at least a graduate level uh, teachers so that they are led and their creativity is enhanced and they are enabled and empowered to be the citizens of tomorrow. Your thoughts on this? Um, yes, I agree totally. If I may point to that uh, submission to the, the reforms document, we really had pre-primary uh, as well as the pre-primary, uh, because there's a national policy also right now on this, uh, uh, this area, but it, it covered from um, basically from zero plus, and um, that was well taken into account uh, in, the, in the reform. I, I merely happened to discuss the part that I was more or less concentrating on as myself or my contribution, that was a tertiary part of it. But certainly, yes, it's, it starts from the very beginning. But it, it has pushed STEM into that area. It's like a child looking at water and then going from grade one to grade two and so on, uh, the water as a subject becomes a little bit more engaging um, as you grow. So uh, it's what we call a, um, it's some um, spiral, uh, spiral, spiral curricula, or a term that's used. It's not, uh, it, this, is not, uh, this is not restructuring, I'm only talking about the tertiary. It actually starts from the, the beginning. That, uh, that reform document that was given. And also was about the, the teacher, teacher training and uh, looking at the different ways of uh, not as just teacher, but more as also a, a, a content provider as well, and using the, the, ad, the additional technologies, even at a very early stage. But of course, that needs some capital infusion, so. Um, Professor Ajit, if I can just uh, make a few comments. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate you on a very excellent presentation, which I think was a, a modern presentation, which I think uh, when you look at what we are doing, uh, it seems that uh, we are really in a very backward situation. That's what we can see. But your presentation was something that uh, was going to take us to the modern world. Uh, let me, before that, also say a few words about uh, Mr. Tennyson Rodrigo because I had the pleasure of uh, maybe working with him on the CDIC board. Well, uh, he was really responsible for making a lot of investments, so uh, I think he was a really a very creative person and also a hard thinker and where he knew uh, the proper investments could be done. And of course, on the urea plant, uh, I think it's a very sad situation. Well, it was all economics, you know. The urea, at that time, the Minister of Finance thought that uh, it could be sold, what was manufactured in the Zapukasan, the plant, at a very much higher price, and that we should not manufacture. But of course, I think these are things that one has to look at, whether we should give the place to the science and technology or to the economic area, but today we are in a very sad situation. But just to talk of the education area, uh, you will see that we are having tremendous problems. Now, you are a product of Ananda College. You know what Henry Steele Hol Holcott came to this country and did. How we set up these schools for the benefit of the nation. But today, all the schools have been nationalized, and you spoke of some private schools, some international schools that have come, which are even not recognized in Sri Lanka, but maybe they are sending their children overseas, where we are having two sets of things that are happening. So what we really find is that the excellent education system that we had, the what, not only Olcott, but maybe the great Buddhist setup and the Christian schools, 
the Hindu schools, and you were talking of the culture, the education, the, all these things have been currently destroyed by the government. Not only have they destroyed the education, but the country has become bankrupt. So I think uh, today we need to see how what you have said could be implemented. I can just tell you that supposing Tennyson and Vinita Rodrigo Trust were running schools, they could have taken your ideas and implemented. But today, is the government prepared to take what you have given and implement it? So there is a big problem in this whole thing, you know. We can make these suggestions. I think you said that you all had so many reports being done. But unfortunately, the management, the method of doing it, it's not the money. It's really the HR and the people are not able to do it. So we need to find a solution to this. Because today we will know that it is only the public-private partnership that can do. You see, at that time, these private schools were funded by the government, by, managed by the private sector. So that's the sort of thing, because unless we make a radical change in this whole system, what you mentioned will never be able to be done. The government will not be able to get the funding, but supposing if you go to private public, even the foreign funding agencies will be able to give that money. So we need to do that, because you just think of your university. What is the age of a person graduating? 24, 25, 26. But what is the age that a person in UK, India, or any other country? 21, 22. That shows the gap that we are having. The real situation that we are in this country. But has anyone recognized that? You finish the school education, whatever it may be bad or whatever it is, you finish at the correct time because they are working to a timetable. But after that, do the universities work to a timetable? Are they able to solve this problem? So that is a real problem. A doctor passes out 27, 28, by that time he is getting married. But then we need to really transform all this. What you have said is very good. But there is a real problem in the implementation. That is the sad situation. So please give some thought to that. And we are really prepared to help. But I'm sure what you have mentioned can also be implemented by the Tennyson and Vinita Rodrigo Trust, where they may be able to bring the STEM, the STEAM to even a few schools and get that going. Thank you. Thank you. I take that. Uh, yes. You, you, uh, the point is this, and again, a scenario that, okay, do I wait till I get everything sorted out before I act? And I think the answer is no. You do in any way possible by you uh, what's needed at the moment. So I suppose that should be the spirit of the, um, the discussion here. I mean, like how to take a decision, right? Do we understand? Is there a need to act? How are we to act? Let's do something. That's important. Then you have fulfilled your part of the obligation. With a little experience in teaching in a Columbus school for one year, I noticed the quality of the teachers is very poor, uh, not only in the subject matter, but about the broad issues, the values, uh, attitudes, is there a way that we can get the government to do something about the teaching, the t quality of teachers? Again, understanding this gap that what we are having now is not what we should be having. And then um, partially also we don't have teacher training, right? All teachers who teach are not trained teachers. Uh, there is a gap in that because just because you are a graduate in the subject doesn't mean that you can teach the subject. That's a whole different, different area. So we must understand that efficiency. And if you go into a teacher training college and see the environment for the teachers, those who are getting trained in that school, you will really identify that that's not a happy environment uh, either. So I suppose we need to understand teaching is a noble profession and had to be done differently. Have to have that 
uh, uh, situation. But of course, I'm also saying that the concept of a teacher is also changing. But that doesn't mean that that value of that part is not is not going to change because you are molding a person. It's just that the tools and the toolkit that you're going to use are different. But the government, we have to understand that what we are doing is not right in the first place. And um, to be sincere about uh, having understood the problem, then you must be sincere about, okay, the need for a solution. And then within your capabilities, you must actually spell out a mechanism that we are going to do that way. That I suppose is a first a must. Because otherwise we are sending the wrong signals, we are talking in the wrong way, and uh, solutions are not going to come that way. We are just hoodwinking ourselves that uh, doing, it's just plastering. So I suppose that's uh, important. And you fail, but you are trying. And you demonstrate that part. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Professor Ajit, uh, for your insightful and multidimensional oration this evening. Um, just to take a point from you, indicated on the science and technology pyramid uh, and the innovations of the society, when we go to the bottom level of the pyramid, we are more technical education and the craft level education is important because innovation is bringing things, the concepts into realization. If without the, the bottom layer properly structured, all these things that have been taught cannot be put into realization. So my question is whether in our SNT education, have we adequately addressed this resource mobilization for this lower layer of the technical education in terms of especially the appropriateness of the curricula and in particular the capacity of the teachers or the, the technical colleges to develop this lower layer to be able to capture these innovations and put into realization whether that has been adequately done in our system? Answer, answer definitely is no. I mean, a, a simple answer. But the point is whether one has been thinking about this. So you can see these vocational training streams that are about 23, 23 plus uh, numbers that have come various different streams. So those are supposed to strengthen those, the, the different layers that you have, the foundation layers. Right, and uh, what in our, our reforms discussion document that one what we put in was all of them are kind of at the same level, because you need you have to understand that uh, they, they they support each other, the presence of one, and the rest uh, together only will bring success, right? Uh, so not that they will be going to the universities, they will be stopping at a different level. But when they are successful or they feel. They have an ability to enter into and, and get an additional knowledge as well. I suppose um, the base, basic country that really practices that may be Germany, right, where they really strongly focused on skills and competencies uh, because of that value. And then you have different pathways, but going, so the vocational pathway and the theoretical pathways or the university pathway. So um, I suppose the putting those vocational pillar probably is an idea in the right direction and an exercise that have been carried out too. But um, resource mobilization wise to ensure that probably is not there. Right, so there because you need to understand perhaps the, the full bigger picture because what happens is once you strengthen, we tend to uh, lose them because uh, they come out and they don't see a position for them and they become kind of misfits. And the numbers are numbers. So, I mean, that's when you analyze, I suppose you are much more aware of it than I am. In the vocational puzzle, um, this, is, this is evident that we have numbers, but they are not matched to what the economy immediately needs or the, the way the economy has been structured. Or we, we just do it as a manpower service to another, another economy. 
So we have time for one last question from the audience. Uh, Professor Ajit Jalvis, uh, it was a very uh, excellent and very interesting uh, oration. So uh, first of all, I would be very thankful for that. And uh, I would like to add uh, uh, some points uh, raised by a few gentlemen. Actually, uh, even we uh, try our best uh, to um, strengthen uh, or modify this current system, maybe ch with changes, maybe steam, uh, stem into steam or whatever. Uh, the young generation, the new generation, they think in a different way. Uh, for an example, even we try to think about uh, um, enhancing uh, the teacher trainings, okay? Uh, because I personally know, because my uh, uh, students, some of my students graduated uh, last month, they already, uh, because nobody cares about uh, following that kind of professional teacher training or something like that uh, in a conventional level because they they, 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 they they tend to start their own tuitions maybe. They know how to market themselves and they know how to uh, go on their own style with uh, the help of uh, social media and whatever, the online tools and everything. And at the same time, uh, students, e even we uh, put many efforts uh, on uh, curriculum development and various things, maybe uh, little uh, course developments. The students also, they, uh, they identify the loopholes in our systems and because, because of the availability, wide availability of uh, various professional new subjects of, uh, through the internet, uh, many people can follow the courses offered by uh, foreign countries. So that, because even, uh, what I wanted to say is, even we put uh, various efforts uh, we, on uh, one specifically, uh, one uh, specific uh, uh, education domain here in locally, uh, but rather than, I, I think it would be much more practical if we, if we also think, uh, in a different way, thinking out of the box, maybe uh, thinking more towards uh, online and uh, I'm not uh, telling about blended learning and those kind of uh, concepts and we can't say uh, those are the only uh, solutions. Uh, we also have to be innovative, I think, uh, with various things and think, uh, properly aligning the thinking pattern of the new generation. That would be very effective uh, and that would be very productive, uh, I think. Just a suggestion. Thank you very much, sir. No question about that. I suppose we should, uh, we should learn. This is maybe reverse mentoring of sort because we need to understand this uh, from that generation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, opening up, yes, um, we are also currently looking at how to have the postgraduate even PhD streams uh, supported with uh, blended learning the, uh, and the distance learning. And we are, we are strongly focused in uh, doing that to attract. But, um, and again, I, I can think of um, another example as currently Morato has seen with, um, in this, uh, with the Center for Open and Distance Learning uh, using this tech developer course where suddenly when you are seen because it's a free course being developed by two faculties and made available on the, on the web. And uh, we have about 100,000 plus engaging from different age groups in that course. So 100,000 plus suddenly has taken University of Moratua in a way to the, the, as the number one university of the, if you take the number of students engaged, whether it's from remote or from outside or inside, but the number wise, uh, suddenly we have become kind of number one. But because of this development of a uh, course that has been made available for full stack developer course, certificates given, uh, students as various, uh, the various age groups can then and then learn Python becomes uh, probably what you need for your AI future. It's happening, yes, I, I, I think we are, I think our, our community is fully aware of this need and uh, it's certainly been factored in. Sure. But I think there's some guidance needed in some way because uh, you can't allow, um, you need some planning because you may find certain segments totally missing. And I suppose 
somebody at some point has to have the understanding what exactly what we need from a full picture. Whereas individual preferences may go on, there's a, if a country or a society to have the, um, then you have to understand we need, how do we get, the, get them excited about switching into different areas and those areas also should be strengthened. Probably understanding the generation, we may have to look at how to attract them. I don't know whether gamification is a way of, uh, we look at gamification and we look at how cities to be run. You are the young guy who is running the city. You run this game and then through gamification, you kind of like um, excite them in certain directions. Maybe those are ways and means of doing it, which is already taking place. I mean, age eight, you are into games and it's doing the right game. Uh, maybe that's the way, that's the way I, I suppose. The answer is yes, definitely. We need to learn from each other on this. We cannot just impose our thoughts and say, look, this is the way to go and this is what you have to do. Uh, I suppose that's a no-no. Sure. Thank you for all your questions and comments.